so we're here at Melbourne Rugby Club, um, John's 80th birthday party. And uh, what John believes is he's, he's got all his guests here. Uh, he's having an ordinary party. He's got an idea sometimes, not quite right. Um, what he doesn't know is, he's obviously, John, this is your life. John's just going to say a few words. Um, he didn't really know that he had a speech to make, but I did say, keep it short to about 10 minutes and it should be all right. <laughs> there you go, John. A few words. <laughs> John thought he was going to make a speech. Well, what can I say except, what can I say except thank you all for coming. I'm pleased, I'm pleased to see so many people. Oh, we missed some more coming in as well. <laughs> Almost missed it. Uh, please enjoy yourself. John? I'm at a loss myself. I really don't know what John? I'm going off. John? 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 You thought you were going to make a speech. But tonight, John Elliott, this is your life. <laughs> Take a seat, my son. First of all, can I say, you can have as much heckling as you darn well please, all right? <laughs> the more the merrier for this. Okay, let's start things off. Have I got me, uh, where's my mouse? Let's just grab that as well. Yeah. Jill, we're going to come to you first, all right? This is your first opportunity to abuse your, your husband. Um, we're just going to, we're just going to ask you, has John been a good husband to you? Can we have the microphone to her, please? Freddie, behind you. She <laughs> Well, it's not been too bad, really. <laughs> I managed to put up with him. Middling. Middling, yeah. <laughs> But yeah, we've had a good life together really. Some wonderful holidays. Two lovely girls. Five lovely grandchildren. Well, four I think. <laughs> yeah. Four that made it. Yes, four that made it. <coughs> Thanks, Jill. Thank you. Well, John, you were born uh, 4th of July 1942 in the Women's Hospital. Um, which is in uh, Friarsgate, Derby. Uh, you're the youngest child of Lewis and Sarah Elliott, and you're one of six siblings, including we've got uh, Peter, Nancy, June, Dorothy, and Wendy. And tonight with us, we've got Dorothy and Wendy sitting over there. Could you make yourselves known to our Freddie for us, please? Freddie? <laughs> Can you please take the microphone over to our Auntie Wendy? We know. Well, Wendy, there's no batteries and it doesn't vibrate, look, so you're going to have to talk into it. It's on. Do you want me to stand up? No, you can do whatever you fancy, darling. If you don't want to do a dance, we're, we're up for it tonight. I'm only a little short person, you know. Uh, Wendy, just give us a little bit of a background about your little brother, if you would. There is no background to John. He's the youngest. Look at that, Dorothy. That's me and John in a school photograph. Because we were both at the same school, because he's only 18 months younger than me. And we were both at the same school till I, till I passed the 11 plus, and then the year after John passed the 11 plus. Um, it, you got, Was he a good kid? There's nothing to say about him, is there? Was he a good kid? Yes, yeah, he was a good lad. He was never in any trouble. Not that I know of, anyway. I don't know about when you were out with your mates. Shall I tell them what your nickname was? No. <laughs> Can we just have a vote on this? Can anybody vote, please, for wanting to know John's nickname? 
His, his nickname was Eggshaw. What was the Eggshaw for? I don't know. But that's what John, that's what's what, the Eggshaw for? How many of his mates are here? Can you, can you not remember him being called Eggshaw? Yeah. Yeah. That was his nickname, anyway. Anyway, um, I, I went to work up at um, Ferris Step, and John went to Melbourne Engineering. Now, as I say, it was no problem. Um, except one day I came home from work and he was sitting at the kitchen table and he said, I'm not eating that. I said, no, what's the matter? I'm not eating that. That's not my mom, what my mum always does on this day. And I was not expecting that and I'm not eating it. So my mum said, I'll, I'll get you something else. I said, you will not. You will not cook him something else. She said, well, he will have to go back to work hungry. I said, well, he'll have to go back to work hungry then, won't he? I said, he's going to be late for work in a minute because he only had half an hour's dinner and I had an hour. And he said, well, I ain't eating it, so I picked it up and tipped it on his head. <laughs> Thank you, Wendy. <laughs> can we pass the mic to Dorothy, please? And the only other thing I can remember is I came home from... I came in one day and my dad was chasing him upstairs. <laughs> and remember that, John? Yeah, he did. Yeah. And he turned, my dad got to the bottom, John was up the top, my dad got to the bottom of the stairs and he turned round and said to my dad, you wait till I'm bigger than you, you'll get all that bugger back again. <laughs> Thank you, Wendy. <laughs> Dorothy. Now... Dorothy, we know that you were the true angel of the family, weren't you? What, what's your memories of your little brother? <laughs> Ginger. Uh, John, well, he was very quiet. Oh, well, I don't need it. He was a very quiet boy. Uh, we lived in the new yard at the time. And uh, he, uh, I think he was only about three when we moved from there. You were six, were you? Oh, no, that surprised me. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's six when we moved then. And uh, it, it never really altered. It was always studious. I never had to tell him to do his own work when he passed his 11 floors. But I never passed mine. The other four went, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I got the best of it. Um, yeah, but I always remember he, he was a sleepwalker. He walked, walked for my, every night, well not every night, but at least twice a week, he'd come and he'd stand at the end of the bed and my, my, my older sister, June, God bless her, she, uh, she used to say, John, you're in the wrong room, go back. And he would do. But then when June left home and Wendy moved in to the room with me, and every time he came in the room, she'd nudge me like man and say, John's here, and she'd dive under the covers. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dorothy. That's wonderful. <laughs> Round of applause, please, for our Dorothy. Freddie, bring it to Grandad, if you would. Pass the mic to Grandad, if you would, please, pal. So, uh, we found out a little bit about him um, from what you said. Uh, you lived at New Yard. I can't get a photo of that anymore. That's a bit odd. Why is that? It's called Thomas Cook Close now. <laughs> Uh, until you were six years old, and that's when you moved to 29 Nettlefold Crescent, there it is. Uh, that's the house that you lived mm -hmm. in until you left home. So you attended Melbourne Infant and Junior Schools. Uh, Wendy and Doc have already told us thank you, what a good child you were. So maybe you can explain to us how you ended up getting the cane. <laughs> I'll give Wendy a tenner later on. <laughs> um, well. I got the cane actually for eating leaves off a hawthorn bush. <laughs> well, they used to cane you for anything in those days, didn't they? <laughs> so, was there, was there a story about you being a climber, maybe? A what now? A climber. Well, yeah, I did get the cane for standing on dustbins as well. <laughs> well, they caned you for anything in them days. Thank you, John. So despite being the village troublemaker, John did, in 1953, just about manage to pass his 11 plus. Significantly later than his brother, I actually to add as well. Uh, you're employed as a local paperboy. I was, yeah. 
and you would spend your earnings on Meccano, uh, visits to the pictures, Meccano. and uh, you had an unusually healthy appetite for photographs of donkeys. Um, you graduated Derby Grammar School in 1958 at the tender age of 16. Yep. And it was at Derby Grammar School where you were spotted by the Derby County talent scout, Frank the Fiddler. Uh, you signed your first professional contract. And I know that some of you here tonight are a little bit sceptical about whether John really did play for Derby County. So what I did was is I went along to Derby County Football Club. Uh, I contacted them, I paid them a visit, and it seems that your career there um, is still leaving a lasting memory and is still influencing the players who are still at Pride Park Stadium to today. <laughs> I've got to find my mouse, here we go. Happy 80th birthday, John. We all know you invented the Cruyff turn, but that Johan fella stole it. Have a good one. Take care. <laughs> Thank you, Curtis Davis, centre-back for Derby County. Very nice, thank you, sir. Let's hear a little bit from Max. Hope you're well. Just wanted to send a message wishing you a happy birthday and that I'm still trying to recreate that world over a kick you scored for Derby back in the 60s. <laughs> Have a good day. Love the Rams. Cheers, Max. Max, defensive midfielder for the Rams. Who's next? Is this guy still playing for you? Former midfielder. Happy birthday, John. That's the game where you scored against Forest in 1967. We'll live in my memory forever. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, fi <laughs> finally, oh, hang on. <laughs> that, how, did, how did that get there? You've got some explaining That's Linda. <laughs> Kate, you said you'd put the filter on for that. John, I hope you're well. I'd just like to say a massive happy birthday. I hope you have a really good day. And obviously I've seen you on the Legends wall. You're a true inspiration. <laughs> the best man at the Rams. That's four of the first team Derby County players. And since these videos were made, they're now the entirety of the first team. <laughs> Sorry over there at the back, boys. I'm not. Not in the slightest. So, uh, you had a string of girlfriends. Aunt Tivy was one of them. Irene Miller, to name just two. One of your ex-girlfriends, uh, she gave you your most memorable times. She can't be with us here tonight, John, I'm sorry to say. And here, therefore, is none other than your ex-girlfriend, now a famous glamour model and an actress, Linda Lasardi. <laughs> Excuse me while I work this blooming mouse. John, it's a bit of a surprise, I know. It's been a long time since we've been out together. And I just wanted to say happy birthday. And sorry I can't be with you on your special evening. I remember all those lovely times we spent together. You're so kind and so humble. And you really are the one that got away. Um, have an absolutely fabulous evening. Think of me. Think of those times when we went out together all those years ago. And... Um, have a lovely, lovely birthday. God bless and enjoy yourself, John. Linda Lusardi. <laughs> um, in, uh, in 1954, you left school and joined Melbourne Engineering as an apprentice. You attended college in Derby as part of the apprenticeship, but I understand that you found it a bit boring. I did, yeah. yeah. Can you explain? Well... Part of the uh, apprenticeship was a day release at Derby Tech. And they went into stuff that I'd done at school when I was 12. <laughs> so I just got totally bored. And uh, I went on the day release, but you had to go two evenings as well. I didn't bother turning up for them. I turned up at the end of the year and passed the exam, but then still failed because you had to pass on attendance as well. So I had to repeat the entire year and get bored all over again. <laughs> I understand there's a, a defibrillator downstairs. Does anybody just try another time? Pop and fetch it. Thank you, John. Freddie, 
Please, can you bring the mic over towards me and bring it over to uh, Dave over here. Dave, can you give Freddie a hand so that he knows where you are, if you would? Oh, going the wrong way. One of your first cars was the Morris Isis, uh, a bit of an unusual car. Um, you started your own driving school, and one of your very first students is here with us tonight. Uh, Dave, what can you remember about your driving lessons with John? Well, before I talk about the driving lessons, uh, let's talk a little bit, bit about John. I first met him at Melbourne Engineering in 1958. Uh, I don't think I'd ever met him before because he went to a posh school. I just went to the modern college of general knowledge. <laughs> and, yeah, art school, yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, I got to know him and uh, in the early 60s, uh, Jim and Beryl Holt um, opened the row book in and it drew like a magnet all the young blokes in Melbourne. There were that many, it's hard to say who went there now. I can't remember some of them. Anyway, um, of the lot who were there, I think John had got the only car, if I remember right. Bronk Reynolds had got a, 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 a what's name, a three wheeler, just like Del Boys. But John has got a proper car. Anyway, I'll get back to that in a minute. Um, but um, it was a great crowd there. There's one or two reprobates here tonight, and there's two sitting here by the side of me, and another one over there. <laughs> and uh, we started our own darts and dominoes teams, even a football team, the Robot Rockets, which you've seen on there already. That, that was Derby County, Dave. Oh, sorry, <laughs> oh, Derby County, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, in this car, it was 15 FRA. It was a, a very strange car. I think it used to belong to the Chief Constable of Derby. Is that right, John? It belonged to the police. Yeah, it belonged to the police. The uh, gear stick and the handbrake were on the right-hand side, the side of the seat. Very unusual. Anyway, uh, before I get to, uh, down to the driving uh, lessons, uh, John used to take us on a Sunday night up to Breeden. And there's, I think Rod will tell you, on the way back, scared to death, it went like a rocket that it did down these S bends from uh, Breeden to to uh, Wilson, and I say it was a very good driver. So um, in the end, when uh, I, I decided to try and learn to drive, John said, "I'll teach you." So I set off from the marketplace and we drove through Wilson, and John says, "Go over the back road. It's a very narrow road." And as I went over the top of the road something was coming towards me. So John says, do an hill start, which I'd never done before. So I did a perfect hill start, no juddering, went backwards and bang, over the top of the hill came another car. <laughs> so in 10 minutes of me starting driving, I had my first, first and only accident. <laughs> he only actually had one student as well, but, strange enough. <laughs> but uh, he was a very good teacher and I passed the first time when I... Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Dave. Thank yeah, you very much yeah. indeed. Can we hear it today, please? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so next we've got 15th of July, 1964. You met your future wife, Jill. I thought I'd let that sink in. You're right. Way out of his league, yeah? <laughs> The thing I'm trying to figure out is, why is he trying to strangle her? Have you seen the size of his hands? <laughs> Freddie, can you bring the mic over to your nana for me, please? <laughs> Jill, tell us about the circumstances that you met, please, don't you? Uh, well, I was a blind date, actually. Um, one or two other boys had met girls that lived in Derby, and they wanted transport to Derby. So, uh, a girl named Sue, Sue Jackson, you know, okay. <laughs> she asked me to make the four up. So that's what, how we met. It was a blind date. <laughs> Is that it? Is that it? That's it. That was... What was his chat up line? <laughs> I'm not telling you. That, that... <laughs> that's too private. <laughs> it's a family friendly show, Jill. You can share with us. It's not going to go anywhere, is it, anybody? 
wandering palms, just let's put it on. <laughs> Say that again, Jill, you didn't quite hear it. <laughs> and I says to him, I don't think my mum would like this. He said, your mum's not getting it. <laughs> Thank you, Jill. Can we have a round of applause again for Jill too? Freddie, can you bring the mic over here for me, please, towards Rod? Rod. <laughs> so, ten days after meeting Jill, you were off on a trip with the lads to Great Yarmouth. Uh, while you were there, I understand you had a little bit of... Oh, it's back to... John, sorry. Back, go back to your granddad a sec. John, can you tell us about the mail that you received while you were in Yarmouth, please, pal? I received a letter every day from Jill. <laughs> and written on the back, where it's sealed, was S W A L K. <laughs> and I was there with all my best friends. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, John. You can come back over to Rod now if you would. Rod, while you're in Yarmouth, was it good holiday, mate? It was, it was a superb holiday. And any particular things happen while you're there? Well, there's one that sticks out in my mind. The year was 1963, the year of the great train robbery. <coughs> there was a gang of us, John, I, and a few of our friends. This particular day, we decided to go for lunch at this pub called the Golfer's Arms. Afterwards, we were going to go to the uh, fun fair and then down to the beach. As it worked out, we had a nice pint, or two. Walked past the fun fair, down to the beach. All this took about an hour, two hours. Where we decided to have a bit of a siesta. But John didn't like sitting on the sand, so he says, I'm going to go for a walk. So about a couple of hours later, while I was on the beach, these two big burly coppers come up to us. And one of them says, all of you, off this beach now, in a very stern voice. We didn't know what we'd done, we'd done nothing at all. Then the other Bobby says, it's been reported by a holly maker that one of you has had an incident with a donkey. <laughs> <laughs> we all look bewildered. <laughs> a donkey? Anyway, they... they they trusted what we said and they let us go. A while later, John came back and we said, John, have you anything to, you know, heard about a donkey being mis mistreated or whatever? John said, I don't know what you're talking about. And that was it. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, well, Rob. It carries on. A, a few years later, Melbourne Wakes, if people can remember years ago, they used to be on a Saturday a load of donkeys. And... Every time I saw these donkeys, I thought of John in Great Yarmouth. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, John. Can we have a round of applause for Rod? Uh, the magic between you and Jill was cemented when you were engaged in 1965. Here you are. <laughs> what the hell were you thinking, Jill? <laughs> And here you are uh, with uh, your mother and um, with Jill's mother. Um, and Jill, can we have the microphone over to you, please, Freddie? What we'd like to know is, can you tell us about how John went about proposing? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, we decided to get engaged. Um, like all good daughters, you have to ask your parents before you can do anything like that. Anyway, it was a Friday night. We'd been out for a drink and we got back home. I lived in Derby, by the way, and uh, I said, we'd better go in if we're going to go and go to Boxer to see Mum and Dad. So anyway, I went in, and uh, I said to my dad, Dad, John's got something to ask you. And he says, uh, what's that then? And he says, uh, John says, uh, me and Jill want to go and gauge. And he says, hey, lad, it's no good talking to me. You better go and ask a mother. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, my mother's up for it. A, a joke, really. She was sat there in a the chair and she says, uh, he went over to her and he says, uh, 
me and, me and Jill want to get engaged. She says, now lad, get down on the knees <laughs> and do it properly. And that's where I had to do. <laughs> you had to ask mother-in-law. <laughs> me too. She used to call him uh, the family guy. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Jill. Can I have a round of applause for my beautiful mother-in-law, please? Your stag night was a very special event, John, travelling as far away as the Roebuck Inn in Melbourne. <laughs> it were different days back then. <laughs> when it was appropriate to invite along Jill's brother, young Dennis Bull. You'll see him down the front there, look. Especially to see Sticky Vicky in a ping pong ball routine. <laughs> Guess what's coming next? <laughs> in 1966, you were married at the Holy Trinity Church, London Road, Derby. Uh, can we have the microphone to John now, please? Just want to know, John, uh, any special reason why you get married in October? Um, what? <laughs> Tax purposes, I suppose. <laughs> uh -huh. Financial reasons, yeah? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Not that you've got a reputation for it, of course, but <laughs> some habits are hard to break, aren't they? <laughs> you have to be careful. <laughs> Thank you, John. So, um, after you were married, you moved to... Oh, do you want to have a look at that? I found that. Jill slipped it to me. Blade checker. Check the blades. After you got married, you moved to 44 Wild Street in Derby. But due to a restraining order issued by the local donkey sanctuary, <laughs> it meant that the following year you were forced to move back to Melbourne. 18 Station Road, Jill. Can you have the mic? I understand that you weren't the only residents when you moved into 18 Station Road, were you? Uh, no, no, we had landlords living downstairs. <laughs> uh, one morning we got up and um, I, could, I, I went into the kitchen sink unit and we all had chip pans in them days that fats was solid and I could see footprints over it <laughs> and we'd got a mouse. Anyway... <laughs> I told John, I said, we've got a mouse in the kitchen. Anyway, he runs around after it. It goes under the fridge. We didn't see it again. But anyway, when he came home from work that night, he says, you never guess where that mouse was. I says, no, where is it? It was in my overall pocket. <laughs> <laughs> he used to keep his overalls at the side of the fridge. <laughs> and it had got in his pocket. So he took it to work. He disposed of it, kind of. <laughs> Thank you, Jill. On your side of your family, John, your uncle to Lynn, Stephen, Sarah, Delia, Clive, Hazel, Christine, Pat, David, Angela and Julie. On Jill's side, your uncle to Tracy, Haley, Adam, Matthew, Robert, Deborah, Stuart, Andrea, Richard, Helena, Richard, uh, Rachel, sorry, Mark, Colin, Martin, Christopher, Darren, Kerry, Gavin, Daniel and Anthony. Have I missed anybody out? Where's our David? David, could you grab the mic for us, pal? What's your early memories of, uh, of your Uncle John? Hello. Uncle John was always there to help. Um, earliest recollection was um, me and my father had been trying to build a balsa wood aeroplane for several months. We called upon him to uh, finish it up. Because we both ran out of patience. <laughs> or at least my father had, anyway. <laughs> Um, but then, sort of, Sunday afternoons was often there talking about algebra and Pythagoras and uh, matrices and quadratic equations to get me through school at them days, which uh, put me in good stead for later on in life. And then I guess shortly after marriage, um, he shared with me all, all his Larry the Lounge lizard. 
computer games which were <laughs> filled in the long yeah, nights. Yeah, of course they were. <laughs> <laughs> so, big thank you to Uncle John because he's been a great uh, support to me through the years. Fantastic. Thank you, David. Round of applause for our David, please. In 1970, you were in full practice for starting a family at your first property, to the Pingle in Melbourne. Life was going well until turmoil hit your relationship when Jill discovered that you were having an affair. Jill, how would you deal with this, Doc? Give her the microphone, please, Freddie. We need to hear the details. Well, I found out he was seeing another woman, another female. And I said, well, it's either her or me. Make your choice. I, un I understand that you caught him on the job, didn't you? I did, caught him on the job, all right. You, yeah. you got a photo of him, didn't you? Yeah. Am I allowed to show it? Yeah. I've got a photo of him riding her. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jill. You went on a family holiday to Barmouth with your sister Dorothy and her family. Can we get the microphone over to our Christine? Can you hold your hand up for us, Christine, where you are? Freddie, can you take the phone microphone over to our Christine? Christine, what can you tell us about the holiday to Barmouth, Doc? Um, so, I remember going on holiday to Barmouth. Uh, clearly, the Elliots, uh, well, it really was just family to start with, but they did invite Clive along because he was in the RAF at the time, and he was the only one who could get in the Legion to get them a drink. So... Uh, um, the, the Sunday that they went, he, uh, they actually shut the Legion so they didn't get a drink. Um, they went for a pint somewhere else the next day and wouldn't take Clive there because he'd obviously wasted his time. Um, clearly, Elliot's don't believe in any pre-marital nuptials whatsoever because they made Clive sleep in one chalet and me in the other. <laughs> and uh, that was it. But while they were, while they were out at the pint, uh, pub one day, Clive and I went into Barmouth. And while we were in Barmouth, Clive obviously needed a, a pee at some stage. I went into the local gents. Um, while he was in the gents, this strange-looking guy followed him in, um, offered him some dosh, which Clive ran out as quick as he could and told Uncle John about it. Uh, John, really compassionate about it, said, well, I hope you hit him and took the dosh. Uh, said, how much did he offer you? And by the way, did you get his address? <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Christine, everybody. John, despite your infidelity, you were blessed in 1974 with the birth of your eldest daughter, Catherine Marie. Uh, I need to save myself from domestic abuse later, so she's called Kate, all right? Uh, can we have the microphone to your granddad for us? Granddad, what can you tell us about the birth of your daughter? Kate. Yeah. Oh. In case you didn't know who she were. Oh. It's, um, it's very strange, isn't it, becoming a father for the first time. You hold a baby and you, you've no idea what to do with it. <laughs> well, the feeling of pride is amazing. She really was a, a lovely baby. Well, she was a lovely woman, never. That's it. Thank you, John. Freddie, can you take it over to your Aunt Kate for me? <laughs> Kate, what do you recall about your father? Well, I certainly don't remember that picture. <laughs> <laughs> One of the um, best memories I've got of my dad is just how patient he is. And um, whenever we'd had our air washed in the bath, my dad always used to sit us, me and our Gemma, he used to sit us down on the floor and he'd be sat on the settee and he'd brush and blow dry our hairs for us. And as he was blow drying my hair, I'd lift up his pyjama leg and pull all the hairs on the bottom <laughs> of his legs. And he used to put up with it for ages <laughs> until he got mad. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Kay. Round of applause Love for our Kay, if you will, please. was born in Portland Hospital, Central London. Many celebrities and royalty have been born at this hospital. Jill and Kate were lavished with every luxury affordable. But John had no intention of paying the bill, so as soon as she was back home, he moved house. <laughs> to 14, the Pingle, Melbourne. In 
1978, you and Jill had been married for 12 years and together for 14 years. The magic was beginning to wear off. <laughs> Your second daughter, Gemma, Gemma Ann, was born at home in a bathtub delivered by Vera the barmaid from down at the Almer Inn on Derby Road. <laughs> It was a very special celebration, you had a shave. <laughs> John, what can you tell us about Gemma's birth, please? Well, that one I do remember. <laughs> I wasn't there for Kate's birth because it wasn't the usual thing in hospital for, for men to attend the, uh, the birth. And I was thrown out a few hours before she was born. But Gemma being born at home, I remember that clearly most amazing experience. And I remember making gallons and gallons of tea for the midwife. <laughs> she was a beautiful baby, isn't she? Yes, and a beautiful woman. Thank you, John. Where's our Gemma? Gemma Ann. Now, you need to take it over to the strange lady over there, please, Freddie. <laughs> Gemma, what can you tell us about memories of your dad? Um, well, like Kate said, he's very placid, always very placid. Um, occasionally, he, if he was cross, he always used to say, bloody hell fire. <laughs> so you knew, you knew if you'd pushed it a bit too far when he, when he shouted that. Um, he used to do our hair, like Kate said. He was always reading to us, homework. Um, hilariously funny I mean we were always laughing because dad's sense of humor is just so dry the number of times we had tears just rolling down our faces because just about something really silly but it was funny he was always good for feet warming always good for hugs um, fab dad uh, always made you feel safe so thanks dad love you thank you Jeremy. Now, while we're in the mood for celebrations, um, there's some special family that can't be here with you tonight, unfortunately. So we're going to hear from somebody that might be just a little more special to you than you expected. Hi, John. Happy birthday to you. And we're so sorry we can't be there with you on your special day. But as you can see, we're in sunny Cyprus. When Lee asked us to do a video for you, we were a bit apprehensive to be honest, as we weren't sure how you or Jill, whether you'd really want to hear the truth. And we still aren't sure that in front of family and friends, now is the right time either. However, given that this is your life and with apologies to Brian, here goes. Well, I don't know if you recall an evening in October 1967, do you, John? Well, you should, because it would appear that after a minor dalliance with my mum, I was conceived on a night of passion, and therefore, not your favourite niece, but your long lost daughter, all set to overshadow the ones you've already got. Sorry Kate and Gemma, but I'm the oldest one now, and what I say goes. <laughs> Lee will shortly be presenting you with an invoice, payable to Brian, for my upkeep for the first 18 years of my life. So I'm sorry, but there'll be no more cruises and fancy holidays for you for the foreseeable future. You may also want to update your will to ensure that I get my rightful one third share. I can point you in the direction of a good solicitor contact of mine if you need any assistance with this. Anyway, enjoy the party and I look forward to making up for lost time with you when, you, when I get back, when we get back. P.S. Jill. Paul's bum is now off limits, as he's now your son-in-law, and that's all a bit weird. Happy birthday, Happy John. birthday, and yamas from yamas. Cyprus. <laughs> Kai and Paul Elliot, everybody. John, can you, can you pass him his invoice, please, Jill? He's only got a little off. She's an accountant. Freddie. Can you bring the uh, microphone over to her? There's somebody over here It's a bit, probably a bit distraught at this stage. Can you, Brian, can you put your hand up for Freddie for you? How are you feeling, mate? 
You've lost your daughter. Well, if you think I'm good woman to believe all that rubbish, <laughs> <laughs> you're on a lemon. I've known John for many years, since the first court in June, Sister Gillian. As regards any dalliance, I know my wife has always been very amorous. <laughs> <laughs> but she wouldn't do that to her sister. <laughs> So I don't believe it. <laughs> what can we say? Thank you, Brian. <laughs> Your Derby County career was in full blossom. You had contracts with multiple merchandisers. And in 1980, you appeared on the catwalk at London Fashion Week. <laughs> you became involved in Melbourne Quiz and you were made chairman of the Melbourne Cardigan Appreciation Society. <laughs> As a member of the Melbourne quiz team, you won the Radio Derby quiz and could barely contain your emotion. <laughs> so I understand the publication Funeral Month Directors Monthly approached you to use the photo, but you declined. As a dedicated family man, you love to spend time with two of your three children. <laughs> you take them to the allotment, yeah. couple of pints at the Legion, and taking them on holiday. And all of these precious memories, while well, you fitted it around your part-time job as a drugs mule, <laughs> shipping cocaine between county lines. Your three children barely noticed when you disappeared for three months. You were caught red-handed burgling a house in Melbourne. You were sent down for six months but got released early on good behaviour. In 1986 you bought 87 Victoria Street, Melbourne and moved the family into a plush modern, state-of-the-art home where you could kick back and relax. Jill, can you tell us a little bit about your experience and your lavish arrangements at uh, 87 Mel the uh, Victoria Street, Melbourne, please, Doc? Well, it, it certainly wanted a lot of work. <laughs> it really did. It was no, well, there was central eating, but it was only in part of the house. There was no double glazing, uh, no loft insulation or anything like that. And actually, John, John was repairing the um, conservatory roof there. And no, he's not, he's a burglar. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, we did get it nice eventually, and then we left. <laughs> <laughs> Can we pass the microphone over to your Auntie Kate again? She's got some special memories she wants to tell everybody about from 87 Melbourne Street. Victoria, Victoria Street, I keep saying it, don't I? My brain, brain's melting, it's so hot, isn't it? Just me, thanks. So, we, me and Gemma, didn't really want to move house, like you don't when you're a kid and you're used to things. And uh, mum and dad promised us if we moved house, we could have a dog. And they stuck to their word the very first Christmas we were there, we had our golden Labrador, Kim. And I adored her. We took her up and down the garden path in a, in a doll's pram. <laughs> But it didn't quite make up for sticking me in a bedroom that in winter had ice on the inside of the windows. <laughs> but they did sort that out very quickly with some uh, cavity wall insulation. But yeah, my overriding memory of that place is ice on the inside of the glass. <laughs> Thank you, Kelly. Gemma, what about your memories of uh, Melbourne Avenue in Victoria Street? <laughs> that keeps changing its name. What's a man to do? Um, I, don't, I don't know. I was a lot younger than Kate, so uh, my bedroom was on the inside of the house. Um, and <laughs> as it... Another yeah. revelation, everybody. You heard it here first. 
Sorry, Dad. That was a secret. Kate was in the shed. I, I, was, I was in the... Well, I wasn't in the extension, is what I'm trying to say. That bit on the edge, that was the cold bit. My, my bit was the other bit, and it was nice and warm. Sorry. <laughs> but as the favourite child, that, you know, seemed, seemed quite fitting. I don't, have too, I don't have too many other memories, <laughs> other than, Mum, can you remember when you painted the hallway yellow? And it was absolutely awful. <laughs> and Dad had painted, it was an old Victorian house, so he painted the hallway, which was like a double story from yeah. the bottom to the top of the stairs, so high by himself, this awful yellow colour. And I remember Mum going, I'm not sure I like it now. <laughs> Thank you, Gemma. John, you're a, re a renowned inventor. And it was at Victoria State Street that you developed and registered your first patent. In the loft, you built yourself the interior man cave. Oh, I'm gonna get my computer to work, where are you? Wake up. There's your patent. Now, uh, I understand, John, that you built this man cave for one special reason, and that was you had two daughters and a wife, and you'd spent three out of four weeks up there to keep yourself out of trouble, is that right? Now I'm looking around the room to fellas who ain't got daughters, you have no idea the pain that we go through. It's the only safe place in the house, isn't it, mate? One of the early visitors to Victoria Street was Jack, uh, your wife's pen friend. Uh, you went there. <laughs> You went there on several trips to America with Gemma and Jill, touring most of the country. Here's John and Jill with Buffalo Bill, famous for supporting women's rights and suffrage, which is something very, very dear to John's heart, because every couple of weeks he lets Jill out of the kitchen. <laughs> you began taking Melbourne Quiz a little bit more seriously. You'd spend hours in the back garden practising your questions with your invisible friend, Malcolm. You'd still want to spend evenings treating Jill to a romantic night out. <laughs> Sipping Carling and Baby Sham down at the Legion. That's, that's a local Melbourne cocktail for those of you who don't know. <laughs> With two of your three children at home, you needed a babysitter. A job that went to your niece, Pat, and her husband, Mark. Or husband-to-be back then. Can we get the microphone over to our Mark for us, please? Mark, can you hold your hand up for Freddie? Mark, can you tell us uh, what you remember about babysitting for Jill and John, please? Well, uh, I was very young at the time. The, f the first occasion, I was only 16, I think, mean, only just met you, I yeah. yeah. And uh, I think they used to go up the Legion, yeah. and the last instruction before they left the house was, no hanky-panky, <laughs> and there's some buffet in the kitchen. Yeah. But on return, uh, after their lovely night at the Legion, uh, the sleeping arrangements was a little bit out of sorts for me because I had to sleep with Uncle John. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> what I can remember, usually when you sleep with somebody strange and you say good night to them, he had a special request for me to say to him, Eeyore, <laughs> before I went to sleep. I found it very strange. <laughs> Is it becoming a bit clearer? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much That's indeed, right. Mark. Round of applause, everybody, for Mark. <laughs> Work became more demanding as you took promotion as the company's computer programmer. You started studying for your degree in 1988 with the Open University, finally graduating in 1996. Eight years. Eight years for a degree. What was it in, John? Maths. It was, it, was it just maths, was it? Nothing to do with computers? Maths yeah. and computers. I'm thinking that they sent you an update every year going, it's now 3.1.2 and you had to start it all over again. Uh, can we get the mic to David again for us, please? So, David, you've got a bit of experience about John taking his degree, haven't you? Yeah, so... 
you know, it's, it's a small world. We never know what's going to happen. There's, there's a lot of incidents in our lives. Um, so, I've had, by this time, in sort of the early 1990s, uh, I've got my own family, you know, we're growing up. And I started to do a degree with the Open University as well. And I couldn't believe it. I walked into the uh, exam one day at the Derby Cricket Ground. Um, and who should be sat next to me? It was Uncle John. <laughs> I thought, wow, I'm going to get away with this dead easy. If I've got any problems, I'll just <laughs> pass them over. <laughs> anyway, um, during the exam, it, it, you know, it's, it's quite stressful, it is, you know, when you're doing these exams. And, you know, we've all been through them. Um, and I sort of noticed him scratching his arms and looking up his sleeves and stuff like that. Um, and then I noticed him looking down into his lap from time to time. Um, and I thought, this is a bit strange. <laughs> no donkeys are there for anything like that. <laughs> anyway, you know, after, after he left the, the exam room, you know, I noticed a book he'd left on his chair, so I've kept it till this day. And I thought it was a good time to return it to him. What book is it, David? It's uh, Computers for Seniors, Dummies. <laughs> <laughs> so I waited till this moment because I thought it'd be really good. But uh, thank you very much for your help over the years. Really. <laughs> thank you very much indeed, David. John, can I borrow the book a sec? Yes. I can't get from around here, though. Mind yourself, that's a bit of double dutch on the way. So, I was curious about this when I spoke to David, so I've done a bit of research, and for John's, uh, for John's degree in computers, I was looking up some of the stuff that he had to learn, and I thought, this is fascinating, I've got to share this with you, this is wonderful. So, um, a central processing unit, it says in here, oh hang on a second, I've said it wrong, it's in capital letters, because it's for old people. <laughs> A central processing unit, which is very small, very high tech. It's a semiconductor chip that acts as the brains of your computer. The CPU is stored in the computer tower with other nuts and bolts of your computer. A monitor which displays images on the screen such as Microsoft Windows, Vista, Desktop, and a document you can get from a software program. A keyboard, which is similar to a typewriter. In addition to typing words, you can use the keyboard to give your computer instructions. <laughs> a bit different to the degrees now, John. <laughs> your daughter's both graduated. Kate in 1996, Gemma in 2000. Neither of them cheated. <laughs> Do you know what I don't? But about, out of the two of you, I can almost guarantee it would be Kate out of two of you. Uh, Vinnie Jones has become famous for being a, a footballer who made it big in the movies, but he wasn't the first. You couldn't turn down the big money offers and had a succession of big hits. In 1982, Stallone was smashed out of his little face on steroids, unable to continue his role as Rocky Marciano, and John's physique was matched in Stallone's brilliantly well enough for him to bag the lead in Rocky III. <laughs> he followed it up with a smash horror, The Shining. <laughs> he broke Sharon Stone's heart in Basic Instinct. Finally, your Oscar-nominated performance came around with Born on the 4th of July. <laughs> Oliver Stone won the Oscar for Best Actor on this film. We've managed to catch up with him. He's working on his latest project, which I believe you wrote for him, which is called My Donkey, <laughs> My Lover and I. And uh, we've got Oliver Stone here with us, and uh, Oliver's got some memories to share with you. I remember when I was first casting for the role of John Kovich for the movie Born on the Fourth of July. John Elliott would turn up for every audition fully prepared. 
I'd imagine maybe Morgan Freeman, Tom Cruise, or Will Smith for the lead role. But it was John, John who was best prepared for the audition. Heck, he came in a wheelchair with his long, greasy hair and his scruffy blue jeans torn at the knees. Hell, he'd even had both nipples pinched. <laughs> Ooh, scary. On the day of the audition, he came into the room with uh, Kevin Hart, Needles, and Kevin Bacon. But I was determined that he wasn't going to get treated just like another piece of meat. So I told him to put his shirt back on and put those nipples away. <laughs> oh, wow, outstanding. Oh, some actors, they can't stand acting in a wheelchair. But John was a natural. I could sense that he wasn't going to be pushed around. And as I, I didn't want him to run away from the pool, I had him on the spot. Well, the next day, when I released to the press, that's when things got sticky. You see, John was a, a movie star. He'd just finished Basic Instinct. He was the, the reigning star, a sex symbol. Young and hung, and here he was in this new role. Everybody was laughing at me, saying, you'd never pull this off. I'd only hired John because of his sweet candy-ass looks. And of course, there was the women. As soon as a woman saw John, they just wanted to make love to him. I had so many, many tickets. But John, he worked like a dog. He'd even go and hang out with other wheelchair people. Although, I have to say, I thought he took it a little bit too far when he got a real colostomy bag. <laughs> um, to be fair to John, though, he did say that when it was full, it helped keep his hands warm. <laughs> well, John was such a sweet guy, you see. The movie was finished. We'd won an Oscar, and the rest is history. Uh, but before we wrapped up, John came to me and gave me both of his nipple piercings <laughs> as a souvenir. Kind of a friendship thing. He even said that I could try them on from now and again. But I, I, I haven't done that yet. He's such a sweet, sweet man. So, John, happy birthday from everybody in Hollywood. And here's to your new production. <laughs> We've got Oliver Stone in the room. Take, stand up and take a bow, please, Oliver. Yeah. Oliver Stone, everybody. Yeah. It's downhill from here, I promise. Uh, in 1995, uh, Kate dragged home some young innocent, unsuspecting fool that she drugged with Rohypno. <laughs> she ended up marrying him against his will in 1988. Uh, 1998, crikey. Gemma and Pete got together in 2002. The marriage audition was lengthy and they eventually wed in 2016, where Freddie delivered the greatest, best man speech ever written. He was op operating a ventriloquist dummy at the time that strongly resembled his grandad. It was the best, best man to ever. It really, really was, wasn't it? In 1998, the, first, the birth of your first grandchild, Callum, from your newly found daughter, Kai. <laughs> Brian, has he been a good grandfather over the years? <laughs> the final act of the millennium was when your granddaughter Alicia Grace arrived in December of 1999. Jill, what were your first thoughts on the arrival of Alicia? I don't think you were Give her the mic, please, Freddie. <laughs> I didn't think you were capable of looking after a baby. <laughs> <laughs> when I walked away from the hospital, that's just what I said to John. I said, they've got a baby now. Oh, God, I hope they know how to look after her. <laughs> Alicia's over there. We failed. <laughs> 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 
Thank you, Jill. In March of 2001, uh, your third grandchild, Joe, was born. Another one from Kai. <laughs> Shortly followed by fourth grandchild, Kira Jade, in June. I say born, but by now, Kate just fired her out. <laughs> it was four months later uh, that Kira and Alicia were abandoned by their parents uh, so that we could take a short holiday in South Africa. It was a competition that we won. And John, Jill, the pair of you stepped up um, to help us to take that dream holiday that we'd won. You both arranged and paid for the kids to stay at the local kennels. <laughs> right, I'm not going to cry. But Lily Rose <laughs> was born to Gemma and Pete um, sleeping in 2007. But 2008 brought great joy for Gemma and Pete with the birth of Polly Kate. And 2010 saw the grandchildren completed with number seven, Frederick Oscar, <laughs> as we like to call him Freddie. <laughs> Take a bow, Freddie. You're not embarrassed, are you? <laughs> Take a bow. <laughs> you retired in 2007 and embarked on a round the world trip with Jill. It included Australia, where you climbed the Sydney Harbour Bridge, Hong Kong, which I don't think Jill was very fond of, uh, Perth, where you visited Uncle Ted, and New Zealand, uh, where you uh, toured in a camper van. And you rode in a gondola above Queenstown. Here you are in Hawaii, where you joined the Honolulu Swingers Club. <laughs> On the left in this photo is Kalani Makani, which translates as hung very low. <laughs> and on the right is Village Bikey, which you can sort of work out for yourself. <laughs> the trip ended in San Francisco, and then a very cold and snowy New York. And you continue to enjoy your holidays. In 2009, you completed all 50 states of America when it is that you finished off by visiting Alaska. It's getting harder to turn the pages. Your family continue to be the centre of your world. And having said that, you still find time to be a political activist. Here you are in London throwing your weight behind something that's really dear to your heart. <laughs> Freddie, can you pop the, word, the, the microphone over to Auntie Wendy for us, please? We just want to mention, uh, I think one of your personal highlights, John, is in 2002 you had the honour of giving away your niece, Julie, uh, when she married Paul. Wendy, can you tell us how it was that John reacted when Julie asked John if he'd be giving well, her away? Originally, Julie asked her brother-in-law to do it, and he, he said no, it wasn't his place to do it. So we ummed and awed, and I said, can I ask Uncle John? So I rang them up and said, can we come over? And they said, yeah. So we came to Melbourne, because we live in Shepshed. And um, they asked John if he would give Julie away. And I don't know whether he remembers this, but he, was, he started crying. Oh. It, his eyes were filled with tears. Yeah, you remember John? Yes, he did. Yeah, yeah, and he, and, <laughs> and he did a wonderful job, and I'm very grateful to him because Julia just lost her dad. So, thank you, John. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, John. You've spent your retirement supporting your family as they've grown and prospered. You spent hours watching Freddie at football, theatre with Gemma, Kira, Polly, and Pete. Show jumping with Alicia. You've redecorated our houses, you've maintained our gardens, your philanthropic taxi service has lost thousands. 
We can't count the hours that you've spent just being there for all of us. Uh, this is all the time, not just for celebrations or commiserations. You're still heavily involved in the Melbourne Quiz and I'd just like, have we got any members of the committee here from Melbourne Quiz? Can I just get you to the stand up for us for just one second? John, can you stand up too for us? Please, everybody, I just want to let you know that Melbourne Quiz, a little rural town, uh, has raised over £23,000 for local charities and good causes. Can we have a round of applause, please? For Melbourne Quiz. Thank you very much, James. You can sit back down. Despite your best attempts to emigrate to Gibraltar during the pandemic, <laughs> we're nearly up to date. When I was researching material for this evening, um, I struggled to unearth any embarrassing dirt on you. Uh, the worst I found was probably being cane for climbing. So with the help of friends and family, uh, we might have exaggerated, uh, even invented some of the stories. <laughs> what I can say about this evening's stories is that they've been created with a great deal of love and affection. Not one person needed any encouragement. <laughs> Having said that, I'm going to finish the evening by going back to something that I mentioned earlier on. And I mentioned your previous girlfriends. And one of them really did want to leave a message for you this evening. So the condition was, she said, you leave it till the end. So as I bring this celebration of your life to a close, I'm going to leave the final words to her. Stay where you are, you don't get away that quick. Come back next week. Right, everybody, are we ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear John. Happy birthday to you. Three cheers for John Elliot. Hip, hip. Thank you everybody, you can get a drink now. We're gonna uh, he's always been very good to me. And after I lost the bill, short bill, he been any time I wanted, I'd only got to the book and he was there. It's wonderful, isn't it? Yeah. I've always adored him. Even when we went on holiday many years ago to Portland, we had a great time. He's absolutely fabulous. I'm very happy to be here. As I've already booked there, thank you very much for giving me my first job at Ashtray Sweeping in London Legion. Uh, and all the hours on Monkey Island in New Orleans, Secret Den in the Loft. Happy birthday, enjoy that. Thank you. <laughs> I 
Well, what a fantastic evening. Um, I can't believe this is your life. That was wonderful. Um, I've known him since about 1958, Melbourne Engineering. There must have been about 30 of us there every night of the week. Very often on a Saturday till 4 o'clock Sunday morning. John was one of them. And then we'd be there at midday on a Sunday. And the landlord used to make this cocktail of ginger ale and ginger wine, bring you around. So we used to start all over again. <laughs> Happy birthday, you're very old, um, congrats on exceeding average life expectancy. <laughs> I love and appreciate you, Grandad. I'm not convinced, <laughs> moving on. Happy birthday. Anything else? No. It's a lovely job. Happy birthday, Uncle John. It's an absolute pleasure to be your niece. Um, I wish you many more happy years in the future.